This morning we're going to be talking about the omniscience of God, and this may bleed over into next week. Uh, we'll see how far we get. So, <clears throat> God is omniscient, and here is my highly sophisticated definition. Uh, God knows everything there is to know. <laughs> that's, my, that's my definition. Some of these superlatives of God that we use, like immutability, uh, really need to be nuanced a bit. So when we say God never changes, well, sometimes he's happy and sometimes he's angry, so that could constitute a change. Um, so immutability, in other words, has to be confined to, okay, in what ways does God not change, right? God doesn't change in his character, his essence, things like that. We'll talk about that later. But omniscience is one that I don't feel like I have to nuance at all. God knows everything, and he knows everything that there is to know. Uh, 1 John 3.20 says, for whenever our, hearts, uh, our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Um, so we're going to look at, I have, I think, seven categories of God's knowledge. Number one, God knows everything in the present. Uh, Job 20, 28, verse 24, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. So God sees everything that takes place. Um, I, I think of Hunger Games, when I read that, like uh, the guy in the arena that has cameras everywhere and he can just see everything going on. Um, that's the way I think of as God. Like he is just above everything and he sees absolutely everything that takes place. So God knows everything in the present. Uh, number two, God knows everything in the past and the future. I'm combining those there. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Again, Isaiah 46, verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other I am God. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. Isaiah 41, verse 21, Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. This is the, the trial of the false gods, where God says, you know, if your uh, idols are real, here's a test for them. Tell us what's going to happen in the future. Uh, verse 22 again, Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, uh, that we may know their outcome. Or, if you can't do that, declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come at hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. And so obviously there, God is uh, mocking the other false gods, saying, you guys can't do this, you're not God, because you can't tell the former things, and you can't predict the future things. Isaiah 41, verse 26, this is the last one on this. Who declared it from the beginning, that we might know, and beforehand, that we might say he is right. There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. And so again, God is um, kind of mocking the false gods, saying they can't tell the future uh, accurately. Number three, God knows everything possible as well as actual. Um, and here I'm specifically refuting what's known as openness or uh, open theism. Uh, how many of you have an idea of what open theism is? Okay, Malachi does. Uh, open theism is the idea that God, uh, basically it's an attempt by some people to get around some of the difficult passages like God re re uh, regretting things or repenting in the King James. Um, how can God regret something? We'll talk about that later. How can God regret something if he knew the future? Like if God knows everything, how can he change his mind? Things like that. And so their answer to that question is God technically doesn't know the future. Um, he knows, what they would say is he knows all of the possibilities of the future, but he doesn't actually know which one's going to happen. Um, he, he knows all of the, the possible outcomes, all of the possible choices that human beings make. It's also a, kind of an uplifting of the free will of man um, to say, well, we are free to make decisions. God technically doesn't know what we're going to do. He knows all the things we might do in given circumstances, but he doesn't actually know which one we're going to pick. Um, that's basically the, the openness of God, that open theism. Um, obviously, Scripture clearly, I mean, 
I don't know how you get prophecy out of that kind of thinking. How can God prophesy the future if, if things are really up to us? You know, uh, we'll talk about some of these later, but like, you know, think of the Joseph, uh, well, I guess that's not the best example. Think of um, many of the prophets. I mean, think, of, think about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. You know, why did that happen? Uh, because, uh, because the Caesar Augustus declared a, a census to take place, which moved the family that lived in Nazareth down to Bethlehem just for that weekend or whatever. And that's when Jesus happened to be born. Um, how does that work if God didn't know when Joseph and Mary would you know, become pregnant, when uh, the Caesar would declare the census? Like all of these different components had to take place in order for that one prophecy, uh, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, to, to happen. So anyways, as far as prophecy, I think you get tied in knots with openness, uh, open theism. But here are just a few texts that uh, say this explicitly, that God doesn't just know what yeah, the possibilities are. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that he does know the, the possibilities as well as what actually will happen. Matthew 11, verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, so God is saying, um, if the things that I have done in Chorazin and Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, uh, they would have repented long ago. So, uh, this isn't, I guess this isn't technically attacking open theism. It's a different angle. Um, God knows things that would have happened even if they don't come to pass. So God knows all of the possibilities. He knew that uh, if he had gone to Tyre and Sidon and done these mighty works, this would have been the result, even though none of that ever happened. <laughs> okay, continuing on, verse 22, I tell you, it will be more bearable in the day of uh, judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Again, the same thinking there. So God knows the possibilities even when they don't happen. Um, he doesn't just know what's going to happen. He knows all of the possibilities as well. Um, number four, God knows our thoughts as well as our actions. Uh, so he doesn't just see what we do. He sees right through us to why we do it. He doesn't, you know, and this is where the Hunger Games analogy breaks down, right? They can see the actions of people, but they don't know uh, what's motivating it, what they're really up to. God can see our thoughts, not just our actions. Hebrews 4.13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Um, to get more specific, I have three points underneath this about God knowing our thoughts. Uh, number one, God... Uh, God knows our prayers before we ask them. Matthew 6, verse 8, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We talked about that a few weeks ago in our series on prayer. Number uh, Next one underneath that, God knows our thoughts before we think them. <laughs> Psalm 139, verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. In that language, most people understand that to mean God sees our thoughts before they're even in our brains. He can see, the, see our, what we're going to think in the future. Uh, number three, uh, verse three, sorry. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So before we even have the words that we're about to speak, God already knows everything we're going to say. Verse 5, you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So God knows our thoughts as well as our actions. And he knows our thoughts before they spring up into actual being. Uh, letter C underneath that, God knows what we would have done in other circumstances. Okay, so again, this is the idea that God knows not only the things that we're going to do, but he knows what we would have done in different circumstances. Here's an example of this. Um, starting in verse 7 of 1 Samuel 23, this is where Saul is chasing after David, uh, trying to kill David. We see in verse 7, Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. Uh, God, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut, shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And so... Saul thinks he's got David here. He's going to be able to capture him. Uh, verse 8, Saul summoned all the people to go to war 
to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. He said to Abiathar the priest, bring the, the ephod here. And the ephod is a way, kind of a strange way in the Old Testament that they had of commu basically getting an answer from God. Um, they could ask a question and somehow God would respond through that. Verse 10, then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. And here's the question that David asks God. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O, God, uh, o Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. The Lord said he will come down. Okay, so God predicts the future. Yes, Saul is going to come down and attack the city of Keilah. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hands of Saul? The Lord said, They will surrender you. And then verse 13, David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. So they left the city. This never took place. <laughs> the, the men of Keilah didn't surrender David because they were gone. But God knew that they would have had he stayed there. So God knows not just the actualities of what's going to take place, but he knows what we would do, what our actions would be given different circumstances. Okay, so um, this is... Stephen Charnock, uh, The Existence and Attributes of God, he writes concerning this. He knew what they would do upon that occasion, though it was never done, as he knew what was in their power and in their wills. And so again, the ability there uh, basically just shows us that God knows everything about us. He knows our actions and he knows our thoughts. Number five, God knows everything down to the most minute detail. Uh, Luke 22, verse 8. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. <laughs> this is such an interesting text. Uh, they don't have, you know, Jesus didn't have a house. He didn't have anywhere where he lived. Um, he relied on the hospitality of other people in the villages that he, was, that he was in. And so he tells Peter and John, Go and prepare the Passover. And they ask a reasonable question in verse 9. Uh, where will you have us prepare it? Verse 10, Jesus says to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Okay, let's just stop there for a minute and think about all the things God had to, that Jesus had to know um, in order to even make this statement. First of all, behold, when you have entered the city. This guy's going to meet you when you enter the city. Uh, you would have to know the pace at which the pe people are walking to know when they're actually going to enter the city. Um, then he knows this man, there's going to be a man there. He's going to be carrying a jar. Inside the jar will be water. Like all of that specificity about this uh, person who's going to meet him. Follow him into the house that he enters. So Jesus knows he's going to uh, walk with that jar of water into a house. Verse 11, tell the master of the house. Okay, so he knows that the master of the house is going to be there. He's going to be available. Uh, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room? He knows the house has a guest room. And where, uh, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished. So Jesus knows that the guest room is large. He knows that it's upstairs. He knows that it's furnished. Prepare it there. And uh, then the commentator says they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. So God knows everything down to the most minute detail. He can declare with specificity things in the future. We saw this several weeks ago uh, when we looked at the account of King Cyrus, the fact that God knows uh, that this king of Persia is going to be a Zoroastrian before that religion even exists, that he knows his name is going to be Cyrus, like all of these details um, that he perfectly predicts in the future. Matthew 10, verse 29. Uh, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Again, just driving home that point that God knows everything, even very small details. He knows how many hairs are on our head. Um, he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. Every time a bird dies, God knows about it. Well, that's the, the degree that his knowledge is. It's funny, we don't tend to think of God that way. We tend to think of God almost in a deistic sense. Um, like he's a little bit hands-off in running the universe. Just kind of paying attention to the major things. 
But Jesus explicitly says, no, he, he knows when a bird dies out in the middle of a forest somewhere. He knows absolutely everything that takes place in his creation. And the application there that Jesus makes is we don't need to worry if our Heavenly Father knows everything, uh, knows uh, all of our needs that we have. Um, and if he, he, if he takes care of the sparrows, he takes care of the lilies of the field and so forth, as Jesus says in other contexts, uh, we can trust that he will meet our needs. Number six, uh, whatever you can think of as a possible exception, God knows that too. Uh, just in case you think there's something outside of God's knowledge, this, this one should cover it. And I'll add that he also knew you were going to think of that exception. Um, for this example, I'm going to use the story in 1 Kings 22. This is where Ahab, the king of Israel, uh, solicits the help of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to fight against Syria. Syria and Israel had been at war for about three years, and uh, Ahab needs Jehoshaphat's help to fight against the Syrian army. Before they leave for battle, though, Jehoshaphat asks Ahab, uh, can we inquire at a prophet of God? Because he doesn't want to go out into battle unless he knows, yes, we're going to be successful. Um, so they ask for the prophet of God, Micaiah, and uh, Micaiah tells them, Ahab is, King Ahab is going to die in this battle. If you guys go out and, and fight this, Ahab's going to be killed. Um, and Ahab gets really upset by this prediction. He hates that prophet. Uh, so he orders him to be taken into prison. And this is where we'll pick it up, verse 28. Micaiah said, this is as they're dragging him away into prison, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hear all you people. So he's just saying, mark my words. The king, King Ahab is going to die in this battle. Verse 29, so the king of Israel, that's Ahab, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you wear your robes. <laughs> I don't know why Jehoshaphat agreed to this. He's the decoy. Uh, you dress up like the king. I'm just going to disguise myself in this battle. That way, you know, we can skirt around this prediction of God that I'm going to die. So, ridiculous that he thought this was going to work. Uh, but the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Verse 31. Now the king of Israel, uh, king of Syria, sorry, had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. So this is their objective. They wanted to kill Ahab. Verse 32. When the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, they said, It is surely the king of Israel. And so they turned to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. Uh, somehow he alerted them to the fact that he wasn't Ahab. Uh, verse 33. When the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. And notice verse 34. But a certain man, just a random guy in the battle, drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. So this guy has a bow and arrow. He just shoots it up into the air at random. And it happens to land in the exact uh, gap in Ahab's armor uh, to hit him. The rest of the verse says, Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. The battle continued that day. And the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until at evening he died. And so he bled out uh, on his chariot. And the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot. And about sunset, a cry went through, uh, uh, through the army, every man to his city and every man to his country. So the king died, was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria. And the dogs licked up his blood, and the prostitutes washed themselves in it, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken. Uh, we didn't get into that prediction, but God had told Ahab that the dogs are going to lick your blood. Uh, so just think about all that God had to know there. God knew Ahab was going to disguise himself. Uh, God knew that this, you know, this random uh, bow and arrow shooter was going to hit that exact gap in his armor and kill him. Uh, God knew where they were going to wash the chariot and that there would be dogs there that would lick up the blood. Like all of these things God predicts in detail. And so not only did he know he was going to die, God knew when and where and how uh, and even the circumstances of his death. And so even things that we consider to be accidental, uh, God knows them perfectly. Again, Stephen Charnock says, Now we must know that what is accidental in regard of the creature is not so in regard of God. The manner of Ahab's death was accidental in regard of the hand 
by which he was slain, but not in regard of God, who foretold his death, foreknew the shot, and directed the arrow. Um, all right, let's get to a few exceptions. I think we have time to finish up today. Um, here's a possible exception. Does God forget our sins? Um, Isaiah 43, verse 25 says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. And so that would seem to say, well, there's something God doesn't know. He forgets uh, intentionally, but still forgets our sins. Um, and my answer to that is, no, he doesn't. Uh, this is an example of, I think we talked about this several weeks ago, about anthropomorphic language, where God, uh, Calvin used the example of baby talk, where, where he speaks in our terms about things, um, but they're not technically, it's not meant to be taken literally. Uh, this is a way of God communicating with us. And so what's being communicated here is not that God literally forgets that we have sinned, but rather he treats us as though he's forgotten. Uh, like in a relationship when you do something wrong and then the person moves past it. Uh, that's what's being conveyed here, not that he literally forgets our sins. Again, Charnock says, so God in pardon is said to forget sin, not that he ceaseth, ceaseth wow, that's a hard word to say, uh, ceaseth to know it, but ceaseth to punish it. It is not to be meant of a simple forgetfulness or a lapse of his memory, but of a judicial forgetfulness. And so in the same way that uh, judicially a judge can release a sentence from somebody, say, okay, you're cleared of this charges, doesn't mean he's forgotten what the person did. It just means he's not going to be held, uh, not going to be held against him. Uh, next, another possible exception: Does God regret things? Uh, similar with the remembering of sins, I would say this is also anthropomorphic language. God does not regret anything, because to regret something means you had to have not known how something was going to turn out, right? God knows. Uh, you can say God regrets in a certain sense. So he can do something knowing the outcome and still feel, um, still be grieved by the outcome. Okay, so in that sense, I suppose you can say he regrets. But he doesn't regret like human beings do um, in the sense of, boy, I really wish I wouldn't have done that. Uh, good example of this, 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And this is one of those verses open theists love. Because they say, oh, God didn't know uh, what kind of king Saul would be. He just you know, had high hopes or something that this possibility would be taken and not this one. And so God regrets that he makes Saul king. But then it's clarified just a few verses later, the very same chapter. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also... The glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. So in the same chapter that God says, I regret making Saul king, uh, he goes on to clarify, I'm not really regretting like human beings do. Um, Numbers 23 verse 19, similar text, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not? fulfill it. So that's another uh, possible exception that I think is not to be taken literally. Uh, next, does God learn things uh, specifically by testing? So here I'm going to go to Genesis 22.1. This is the account of uh, God testing Abraham. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. We're not going to take time to read the whole thing, but God goes on to say, you know, go up on the mountain, offer your son Isaac uh, as a sacrifice there. And then as, as he's about to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, God stops him, verse 10. It says, Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So that could be taken to mean, you know, now I know. So God didn't know. And then after Abraham passed this test, now God knows. Uh, I think this test, first of all, we need to acknowledge God did already know how Abraham was going to respond because the next verse says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So God already had enough confidence in what Abraham would do 
that he had a substitute lamb uh, supplied there because he knew that the outcome of this was going to be Isaac would not be actually uh, killed and that, that Abraham would go through with this. So, yes, this test was to bring to light something that God already knew was there. Uh, in that sense, I think the test was more for Abraham than for God. Uh, God's foreknowledge of an event does not preclude his appropriate reaction. This test was a confirmation. And Abraham becomes an example of faith and obedience to us. And so, no, I don't think this is an example of God testing Abraham so that he could learn something that he didn't already know about what was in Abraham's heart. Uh, maybe a clearer example of this is the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, where it says, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus is not asking this question for information's sake, uh, but as a test to Philip. And it's not, a t uh, it's not because he didn't know what Philip was going to say, but it was to reveal something to Philip. Um, so God's tests are not for his uh, information, but for ours. Um, so, God, I, I think we can say from all the things we've looked at, God perfectly and exhaustively knows everything about himself and his creation, past, present, and future, actual and possible. And I think the application of this uh, whole study should be that we should trust God. We should trust what God says more than our own judgment because he knows way more than we ever could. Uh, the analogy I use is like uh, somebody you ever done a, a corn maze or something like that where you're walking in a, a maze and uh, you know pretend there's somebody way above the maze with a radio telling you which way to go. Um, how foolish would it be to say, well, I really think I should go left here when the guy above the maze is telling you go right. Um, that's the way we ought to think about God's omniscience. He knows everything. He sees everything from his vantage point, And so we ought to trust his knowledge. Our knowledge of anything happening in our lives is always limited. Job 42.3, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Uh, this is a classic example. Job, uh, all of these things happening in Job's life, he thinks he knows what's going on, um, but he doesn't. And God reveals to him, you know, you questioning what I'm doing in your life just shows your ignorance. You don't see things from my vantage point. You don't understand the things that I do. Um, and so we should not question God, but rather trust in his knowledge. Um, another good example of our limited knowledge in comparison to God's is the Joseph story in Genesis 50. I'm not going to read all of this. I'm just going to summarize it. God, at the, end of the, uh, at the end of Genesis, says, I'm sorry, Joseph says, God meant this for good, but you meant it for evil, talking to his brothers. Um, so everything that happened in Joseph's life was meant to preserve Joseph and his family from the, the famine and from starving and ultimately to preserve the line of Christ. Um, but let's just kind of track through some of these events that God had to know about in order to make this happen. Number one, God had to know Joseph <clears throat> was going to be sold into slavery by his brothers and not killed. Remember, that was their original plan. And then they went back and said, no, we're just going to sell him into slavery. Um, God also had to know that the highest bidder for this slave would be Potiphar. Uh, he also had to know that Potiphar's wife would lie about Joseph, and Potiphar would become so angry he would imprison him. God also had to know that he would imprison him. Um, at the, the timing would, would overlap with the imprisonment of the butler and baker, because that's his way out of prison eventually. God had to know that Pharaoh would reinstate the butler, and that Butler would eventually remember this incident with Joseph in the prison, and he would respond by putting Joseph in charge. All of that was known by God before the brothers ever sold him. And it was known by God because it was ordained by God. God was sovereign over this whole process. And so we should trust in God's knowledge and in what he's doing in our lives, even when we don't see it, when it doesn't make sense to us, because his vantage point is so much different than ours. Um, this is the last point. I think it's number seven. God knows everything in one simple and eternal act. And what that, that's theological jargon a bit. What that means is God doesn't have to learn anything. He doesn't have to calculate. Um, he has always known everything, and he knows it uh, simply, which means 
In other words, if you ask God to give me the number of the stars in existence, he wouldn't have to count. <laughs> he already knows everything. Um, he doesn't have to calculate. God never ponders anything. He doesn't have to reason two conclusions because he knows everything. Uh, he never learns and he never forgets. He has present and perfect knowledge. Uh, one last quote from Charnock, but God knows all things before they did exist and never was ignorant of them. And there he quotes from Acts 15, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He therefore knows them all at once. The knowledge of one thing was not before another, nor dependence upon another, as it doth in the way of human reasoning. And so we're back to my original definition of omniscience. Uh, God knows everything there is to know. And I don't think there's any sort of limitation on that. We actually have a couple of minutes for questions. So any questions on omniscience? Or any uh, exceptions that I didn't think of? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So does God, well, there you're getting into really the question of God's sovereignty and human free will. Um, because does God know everything because he just kind of looks ahead and knows what's what we're going to do? Or does God know everything because he makes a prediction and then kind of makes it happen? <laughs> right. But Potiphar's actions. Right. Correct. Yep. Well, I would say both are true. That yes, God knows absolutely everything in the future. And one of the reasons he knows that is because he's doing a lot of it himself. <laughs> so yes, God knows what his actions are going to be. And so in that sense, that's another reason why we can trust in God's um, predictions of the future. First of all, there's no chance God's wrong because he sees the future clearly. Secondly, there's no chance God's wrong because God is in control of the future. And so both of those realities, I, I think, are true. And I don't think they contradict one another. Um, so, some people have argued that, you know, Jesus' Messiahship, him fulfilling those prophecies, well, he was just kind of making it happen. Uh, and in some ways, sure, you know, him riding on a donkey in Jerusalem, he knew that prophecy and he made it happen. Um, but him being born in Bethlehem, he didn't have anything to do with. You know, th there's a number of other things that you could point to and say, well, he didn't, he didn't control that one. Um, him going to Egypt and then coming back, him being from Nazareth, all of those details mentioned in Matthew as, as fulfillments of prophecies. You know, the little two-year-old Jesus had nothing to do with it. So, Malachi, you had a question? Right. But just in terms of comparison with uh, computers and their ability to sort of calculate and get hold of all these massive amounts of data and, and access, you know, those bits of data instantly, uh, you know, you think that God is in sort of knowledge of processes, uh, so much more gargantuan. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that contrast between our our so limited knowledge um, and God's limitless knowledge makes it seem so foolish when we question Him. When we think, you know, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? I, I don't approve of this. Like, what? Who are we? Uh, it, it's similar to a two-year-old, you know, correcting his parents on some decision that they're making. But it's it, the gulf is way more than that. Uh, but it's th that sort of mentality.